So today I want to talk a little bit about foundations. And a lot of people, when they hear foundations, think about uh, you know charitable foundations, um, you know, from the United States. But what I'm talking about are civil law foundations. Civil law foundations. The, the simplest way to describe a, a civil law foundation is it's like a company without shareholders. It's basically a cross between a trust and a company. So as a lot of people know, trusts are generally set up for the benefit of a beneficiary, right? So um, the way a trust normally works was, let's say I want to set up uh, a trust for the benefit of my kids, right? So I have assets, I become, uh, I'm the settler, I'm the one that's going to set up the t trust, I'm going to settle the trust. And I go to the trustee and I say, hey trustee, I'm going to give you my assets and I want you to keep those assets, invest them, manage them for the benefit of my children. And then I want you to distribute those assets to, to my kids, uh, however I dictated it in the trust agreement, right? Whether this be, um, you know, all at once or at the trustee's discretion or, you know, on my death or, or whatever it is. Now, trusts have been great estate planning tools um, in the common law world. It's, it's the gold standard, right? I mean, that's what most people use. But in the civil law world, um, trusts generally aren't recognized. And that's where foundations come into play. Now, I think one of the biggest differences between trusts and foundations is trusts, which is a common misconception, trusts aren't actually entities. Uh, they're contracts. They're contracts between me, the settler, and the um, trustee who's going to manage the assets. Whereas a foundation is an actual legal entity, right? It has a corporate personality. It's registered somewhere. It holds property in its own name rather than in the name of the trustee. And foundations are really flexible, right? You can set them up for a specific purpose or you can set them up for the benefit of beneficiaries, right? So you could set up a, a, a foundation, for example, to own, uh, you know, shares in a specific company for a certain amount of time and then dissolve if you wanted to. You could form a charity to benefit the arts, uh, sorry, form a foreign debt foundation to benefit the arts, or in, in going back to my example with this trust, I could set up a foundation for the benefit of my children. And the way this would work is like this. Uh, I would be what's called the founder and I would found the foundation. Um, I would then elect uh, a council uh, that kind of acts like the trustees or a board of directors of a company that's going to control the foundation's assets. Um, and they're going to control and manage those assets and then distribute those assets to the beneficiaries or qualified recipients as, as they're called here in, in the UAE. Um, and those qualified recipients can be like my children, for example. And I, I can dictate in the governing documents of the foundation whether you know those um, assets should be distributed to my children at the discretion of the council um, or you know at certain periods of time or certain ages or upon my death or, or however I want, right? Um, and then you can also, so, so the main parties then to a foundation that's going to have beneficiaries or qualified recipients is the founder, the person that's setting it up, the, uh, the council who's going to manage it, and the qualified recipients or beneficiaries. You can also have something called a guardian. And a guardian, generally, I mean, you can customize the, the, um, you know, the powers of a guardian, but, but the guardian essentially is... Uh, sort of uh, in, in, an oversight mechanism for the council. So you appoint, a, you know, appoint a guardian and the guardian can be, you know, a law firm or an individual. It can be the founder in many cases. And it's the, the um, guardian's job to uh, keep an eye on the foundation council. And if the foundation council isn't doing the job properly, then the guardian has the ability to remove and replace them. You can even structure it that the guardian has the ability to remove and replace them as they want, right? And a lot of times what people do is the founder, the person that set up the foundation, can also retain certain powers, right? So what a lot of people do is they say, 
uh, like, okay, in, in my, you know, using myself as an example, I set up a foundation, I'm the founder, I elect um, the council members, and then I retain uh, certain rights as the founder, like, you know, to be able to uh, remove and replace council members during my lifetime, and then when I die, uh, the guardian, um, you know, takes over what my role was, right? Or if I don't want to have that power, I can always just relinquish that power now and leave it to a guardian. Um, and so anyway, that's just a brief overview of what a foundation is. Personally, I think foundations overall offer, uh, are far superior to trusts because uh, it's not a contract. It's actually a, a recognized legal entity. Um, the foundation holds uh, assets in its own name rather in comparison to a trust where assets are held in, in the name of the trustee. Also with a trust, um, the trustee has a fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries, which often makes it uh, uh, tough to find trustees uh, that will sometimes own private companies or, or high risk assets, because if they manage it improperly, you know, they may have breached their fiduciary duty with respect to the beneficiaries. With the foundation, um, the council owes, owes a fiduciary duty to the foundation, not to, to the beneficiaries. So you have a little bit of a, um, uh, it, it's a, it provides a little bit more liability protection for the council as opposed to the trustees of, of a trust. Um, uh, foundations, the, the other big benefit, whereas a trust, is recognized in, in the um, common law world, it is not recognized in the civil law world, which is a big disadvantage if you are living in a, civ in, in a civil law country, you move to a civil, civil law country. Uh, a foundation can really accomplish both, right? Because uh, a, a, a foundation is a civil law construct, it is a civil law entity, so they're automatically gonna recognize it. But for U.S. persons, you can draft a foundation so that the U.S. will treat it like a trust, right? So you can get, so even if you're a U.S. person and, and, and you want to set up a foundation, you can set up the foundation and get all the benefits from the foundation, right? Like better asset protection, um, you know, this, this uh, no fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries. You have an actual entity rather than a contract. You can get all of these benefits um, by having somebody properly draft it so that the U.S. will recognize it by, by a trust. That's a huge benefit because that basically means that foundations can serve anybody anywhere in the world, right? Regardless of whether you're in a civil law country or you're in a common law country. Um, so foundations are really flexible entities. They're really good. I think they're, very, I, I think they're superior to trusts. Um, in, in a lot of ways, you have a lot more flexibility with them. And I think people should really start uh, considering setting up foundations uh, as opposed to trusts. Now, when you're talking about, uh, you know, U.S. persons, or, or even if you're talking about like, you know, let's say somebody from a civil law country, you know, a lot of times they say, well, you know, why don't I just, and I'm gonna use an American, for example, an American say, well, why don't I just set up a domestic asset protection trust? Well, a domestic asset, asset protection trust in the United States will not provide you as much asset protection as a foundation established as a foundation established somewhere like here in the UAE at, at RAC ICC where we set up foundations. And the reason being is this: as long as your trust is in the U.S., right, and your trustees are in the U.S. and the assets are in the U.S., the U.S. courts are going to have control over the trustee and the assets, right? So if a U.S. court has power over the trust, the trustee, and the assets, you really have very limited asset protection because, you know, judges have been known to go in and modify the terms of trust agreements. They've been ordered to, uh, they've ordered trustees to turn over assets to creditors of the settlers of the beneficiaries. Um, they, you know, ruled trusts to be a sham in certain situations. And even if they can't get around, um, you know, the, even if a court can't get around uh, the trust agreement or, or, or the trustee, a lot of times they'll just go, you know, take the assets out of the trust and give it to whoever. So you really have very limited asset protection 
uh, using any type of, of, of U.S. trust structure. So, and, and I'm going to use the example of somebody who potentially has, like, let's say, a foundation in, you know, I don't know, Germany, right? It's a German with a foundation in Germany. You have a similar problem, right? Like that foundation is set up in Germany, and German courts like will have jurisdiction over that foundation, over its council members if they're resident of Germany, and over the assets if they're if, if they're in Germany, right? So and, and because that the founder is resident in Germany, that's probably where most of his liability is located. So again, it's providing limited asset protection. Now the foundation does provide a little bit more asset protection in, in the case of this German example, um, because it is a separate legal entity and, and, and once the assets are in there, it's pretty hard to get them out. But a much safer uh, alternative would be to set up a foundation in a third jurisdiction, right? Like in, in, in the UAE at RAC ICC, for example. So now you have a foundation somewhere that has very strict asset protection rules, doesn't recognize foreign judgments from creditors, um, doesn't recognize foreign inheritance, forced airship rules or anything like that. You know, it's designed to be an asset protection vehicle. So that means if, 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 a, if a court from Germany or the United States wants to force the foundation to do anything, they're going to have to come sue here in the UAE. And that's going to really be an uphill battle because these things are designed to be asset protection vehicles, right? So the courts here aren't going to be inclined to, um, you know, help out a foreign creditor. I mean, of course, if it's an egregious case or criminal, it's a different story, but it would be very, very difficult to, to get access to, to a foundation's assets here, especially if the council members are not in the United States or Germany and, and, and they're here local in, in the UAE. Um, now, of course, if the foundation's assets are, are in the United States, uh, you know, you still have the risk that the U.S. court could go in and say, well, we don't care. We're just going to disregard this foreign um, foundation and move the assets uh, to whoever we want to. But especially for liquid assets or investments outside of the United States, I mean, this is a pretty bulletproof uh, asset protection vehicle. It's also something that's very, very private, right? Um, the, the, the RAC ICC does have a beneficial owner register, so they do know, you know who the founder is, who the beneficiaries are, the council members, guardians, stuff like that. But this is not a public beneficial owner register. The only way that beneficial owner register can be accessed is you know, generally in, in, in a criminal matter, right? Um, so it would be nearly impossible for a creditor uh, or an ex-wife or something like that to actually be able to, you know, get assets from this foundation or, or even find out, you know, that you're behind this foundation, right? So the point that I'm trying to make is you really want to look at your asset protection structure um, when you're setting it up and you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket, right? Like if you have assets in the U.S., you don't want to keep your liquid assets in the U.S., your tangible assets in the U.S., your trust in the U.S. Uh, and the same goes for Germany or Austria or wherever else, right? Um, you want to look to internationalize your life a little bit and put some asset protection structure somewhere else. So, you know, maybe you do a foundation in, in, in RAC ICC, you move some of your liquid assets to Switzerland or somewhere else, you have that owned by the foundation, you only keep your U.S. tangible assets in the U.S., also have that owned by the foundation, maybe you throw an intermediary holding company in there. So there's a lot of things that you can do to really provide a lot of asset protection, but I really think people um, regardless of whether you're from a, a common law jurisdiction or a civil law jurisdiction, really need to be looking at foundations a lot more seriously. They've been long ignored from uh, people in common law jurisdictions, mainly because attorneys and, and, and asset protection advisors and stuff like that don't understand them, and so they stay away from them. Um, but they're really... Uh, very powerful vehicles, they're very useful, they're very flexible. In my opinion, far superior to trusts. And if they, if you get a, a competent advisor to draft this thing so that it'll be treated as a trust for U.S. tax purposes, then you have all the benefits, right? You have the, the trust taxation in the U.S., but the asset protection of, of, a, of a foreign foundation. So, you know, this is something that we set up a lot for our clients. We work with our clients a lot to set up 
uh, U.S. compliant tax compliant foundations um, that will be treated like trusts and can be used for estate planning and asset protection, succession planning, all that good stuff. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about foundations or setting one up, uh, we can help you. Check us out online at www.esquiregroup.com or drop us an email at info at Peace.